I'm happy to welcome you all back to Clinicians Brief, the podcast, the conversations behind the content. I'm your host, Dr. Alyssa Watson, and my guest today is Dr. Britt Tevelin, an assistant professor at the University of Georgia and the author of a recent Clinicians Brief article, which compared therapy protocols for acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome in a dog. How are you doing, Dr. Tevelin? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. We're really excited that you could join us today. I'm super excited about this conversation. This obviously is a um, a clinical presentation that we see a lot, and so and it has a range of severity, which um, you know we'll talk about in this episode, and was kind of the focus of your article. But before we do that, I would love it if you would just introduce yourself to the audience, tell us a little bit about your background, where you are now. Okay. Um, Well, I'm Britt Tevelin. Um, I am originally from Belgium, and I went to vet school there. I did my rotating internship there, and then I came here um, to the United States for further education. So then I did an ECC internship at the University of Georgia. I stayed on to do my residency, and somehow they can't get rid of me. Here I still am um, after residency as a uh, clinical assistant professor now. So that's where I am. Well, that's wonderful. We're so excited to have you over here. And, you know, I hear that a lot where people do their internship and then end up staying and and take a clinical position. So that's fantastic. Um, So I've been practicing for almost 20 years now. And definitely when I learned about this syndrome, we called it HGE. It was hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. That's kind of the, the nomenclature that I learned. We have shifted that recently. So now they they talk about this syndrome as acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. What was the push behind renaming this condition? Yeah, so um, actually there was a study that they did in tw- back in 2013 um, that was published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine. And uh, they looked at 10 dogs with presumptive HGE or AHDS, and I I have to say I find it very hard to say AHDS too, so it's either acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome or HGE for me, but anyway, they looked at a bunch of dogs who had uh, acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. They performed endoscopic GI biopsies on all of them, and they actually showed that those biopsies didn't have any major lesions in the stomach, and so because um, previously, because dogs actually usually vomit with um, HGE, um, they assumed that the stomach was involved, but given the lack of lesions in the stomach, it seemed like there was no evidence of gastritis, um, and the vomiting could actually also be explained by just severe enteritis or just severe inflammation in your intestines. Um, and so that's why they pushed for kind of changing the name to um, acute hemorrhagic um, diarrhea syndrome rather than hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. I'm honestly really glad that you said that you struggle mm-hmm. with <laughs> With the acronym as well, even writing it a couple times, I I, I wrote something like ADHD, or so, and I'm like, that's not right. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> um, so what is the current understanding of the role played by Clostridium, the Clostridium bacteria right now? Yep. So actually, in that same study that we just talked about, and in a couple of other studies that looked at postmortem changes in dogs with acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome, um, they found that an overgrowth of Clostridium perfringens. Um, So since Clostridium can also be found in the intestines of healthy dogs, or potentially Clostridium overgrowth could also be secondary to damage in the intestines, they initially weren't sure whether Clostridium was actually involved or not. Um, More recently, though, you know, We know that Clostridium is a really versatile bacteria that has a lot of different types and they can produce different virulence factors, different toxins. And so at the moment, the current evidence leads us to suspect that a more recently discovered toxin called NET-F, which is a a pore forming toxin, is likely the major virulence factor that's responsible for acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. However, it's definitely possible that there's other toxins or other virulence factors that we just haven't found yet that may also play a role in some cases. And then there's also ones that we have discovered that may make some cases more severe than others. Um, And so they might not be the only cause for acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome, but they might be contributing factors on those um, Clostridium bacteria. Either way, um, currently we do assume that Clostridium is involved um, and that you have to have certain virulence factor or certain toxins to make it like actually be a severe acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. 
And then the article centers kind of around a four-year-old spayed female Yorkshire Terrier, and it goes through a couple different presentations. But is that a fairly typical signal signalment when you have acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome, a small breed, young dog? Yeah, so theoretically, dogs of any breed and any age can be affected, um, but it, the incidence of acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome is greater in middle age, so like five-ish year old dogs and small breed dogs. Um, I think a, a, a study showed that the median age, median um, um, size was about 9.8 kg, so you know, oh. a good a little over 20 pounds. Okay. And then what other differentials should be high on a clinician's radar when a patient just comes in with acute hemorrhagic diarrhea? What else should we be thinking of? Yeah, so that's a very long list potentially. Um, I guess, so I, I sort of thought about, you know, some top differentials that I would have in acute hemorrhagic diarrhea and a shocky patient, because I think you we definitely need to differentiate these patients from just acute hemorrhagic diarrhea, which might just be, you know, like, a stress colitis versus the very shocky acute hemorrhagic di diarrhea patients. And so if you're seeing shock in combination with hemorrhagic diarrhea, um, some other important differentials to keep on your list would be things like Addison's, a severe pancreatitis, maybe even acute liver or kidney failure. Some anaphylactic animals can, you know, vomit and then have mm -hmm. really severe diarrhea and just collapse. Um, potentially an intestinal foreign body. I know a lot of people don't generally think that diarrhea is, is common with a foreign body, but definitely seen it before, um, maybe even like a linear foreign body. Um, sometimes an intussusception can also lead to uh, acute diarrhea and, and especially hemorrhagic diarrhea. Same with like a mesenteric folliculus. Um, besides that, infections like Campylobacter, Salmonella, um, even Parvo, if it's, you know, not a vaccinated dog or a young dog or something like that. And then there could potentially also be toxins that could cause GI irritation like NSAIDs. And then I guess the other big differential would be, is it like actual bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract? And so you can see bleeding because of either thrombocytopenia or uh, sure. GI ulceration, things like that. Do, have we noted any kind of seasonal correlation? I just, you had kind of mentioned parvovirus and I know parvovirus, we definitely see seasonally. Um, is there anything like that with acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome? Yeah. So there was one study that showed that maybe it was more likely to occur during winter months than during other seasons. No other studies have, have noted that. And I, I guess I don't necessarily see that in practice. I, I don't know if, if you have that experience too, but I feel like it's a year round thing. I have not noted that personally, so I was curious yeah. as to what your experience was as well. So definitely Parvo, though, I definitely see seasonally. Yeah. So one big thing, you know, that I think uh, we are seeing advances in for multiple GI conditions is this idea of the microbiome. Uh, do we have any indication of what role the microbiome plays in the severity when we're talking about cases of acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome? Yeah, so I think that's a very interesting question and honestly one that I can't completely answer. And I think part of it is that, you know, we've been seeing all these recent things and people have recently been doing a ton of research on this, but there's nothing that like specifically says it, like how do you measure your microbiome and how do you say whether that is an effect on, on your acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome or not. So I think like you could conject conjecture that having a healthy, diverse gut microbiome is probably makes it less likely that Clostridium could overgrow and cause and, you know, produce those toxins. Um, however, I don't really have any evidence to back that up and, and that evidence isn't quite out there yet. So. One of the things that, you know, I always think of as this, you know, hallmark sign of acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome is this really severe hemoconcentration but is there really like a specific hematocrit cutoff value that we can definitively diagnose AHDS with that? Yeah. So historically, they always said, you know, a PCV greater than 60% 60, 60 is what's used mm -hmm. to define AHDS. But um, I don't feel like that's always true. And a recent study backs that up. They, they looked at 108 dogs who showed that the medium PC, PCV at presentation was actually 57%. So I think, generally speaking, dogs with AHDS will have a high normal or high PCV. And if you have a low PCV or a completely normal PCV, it probably rolls out AHDS. But just because it's not like wildly elevated, um, I don't think that rolls out AHDS. <laughs> doesn't have to be 70 or 80. <laughs> yes. Although I had one that was 81 um, this week, actually on Monday. 
Oh, wow. I think that's the highest I've seen. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely higher than any I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> So what other changes are commonly observed on, on a CBC and a routine chemistry panel when we're, we're looking at patients with AHDS? Yep. So on a CBC, on your leukogram, you usually see just a stress response. So you'll see a mild, mild neutrophilia, lymphopenia, maybe an eosinopenia. Um, in some dogs, you can also potentially see a mild little left shift, so maybe like 2% bands or something like that. And that's just because of the severity of damage to your intestines and, um, you know, your bone marrow is trying to push out new neutrophils to go fight that. Um, usually platelet couch platelet counts should be pretty normal, and as discussed earlier, your hematocrit should be high or a high normal. Um, on chemistry, there's no like typical changes other than maybe a low normal total protein, um, especially after you rehydrate them. So generally speaking, sure. they'll have major losses of protein in their GI tract, and so you would expect that total protein in a severely hemoconcentrated dog to actually be high, but they often end up being normal because they've lost a lot of protein and then you rehydrate them and then that protein comes down pretty significantly. Um, Even potentially... more. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. So because yep. you, like you said, you would expect that, or, you know, when you see hemoconcentration, you expect that total protein to be high too, but if they're also losing it, you know, then that's going to balance it out. <laughs> yep. Exactly. So kind of the combination of that high hematocrit with a low normal um, total protein is, is what in my head is, is really typical for HDS. Um, and then there are some other things that potentially you could see. So in some severe cases, you could see like a mildly elevated ALT, and that's usually due to hyperperfusion of the liver. Potentially you could get like a mild prerenal azotemia just because, again, they're pretty dehydrated. Um, and then if you were to do a blood gas, you could definitely see a lactic acidosis if they're in shock like most of them are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you had mentioned the azotemia. Sometimes you can see a higher BUN with GI bleeding too. Isn't that correct? Yep. True. Although I don't feel like a HDS dogs really do that. I don't know if it's not like true GI bleeding as in like large mm -hmm. losses in the GI tract since that BUN is elevated because, you know, you're reabsorbing some of the protein from those red blood cells. And so maybe it's not enough red blood cells to really see that. I don't feel like clinically we necessarily see the like disproportionately high BUN, I guess. Right, exactly. Is there any utility to performing other diagnostics, radiography, ultrasonography? What about some of these newer GI PCR panels? Yeah, so I think all of those diagnostics are very useful in ruling out other causes for hemorrhagic diarrhea. So like we said earlier, you know, there's a lot of potential differentials, and if you are concerned that it could be something else, those definitely make sense. And at the moment, like I said earlier, we suspect clostridium perf perfringens can cause AHDS, um, but only with certain violence factors like that net F toxin. So like culturing feces for clostridium isn't a definitive diagnosis because you can see clostridium in the, in, in the feces of healthy dogs. Um, you can't necessarily test for that net F toxin on like a commercially available test. And so in the end, acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. So if you really want to be complete, then you need all of those other tests to rule out every other potential um, differential. That being said, I don't think that's necessary for every single case. I think, you know, in the really severe ones, it makes sense to make sure that you're not missing anything else. Um, or if they have other, you know, confusing factors or things that don't fit 100% with a the presentation, then maybe it's fair to do all those other tests. But in just a kind of acute diarrhea that's acting exactly like HDS, maybe, maybe all those other tests aren't necessary. Okay. And is there any indication that AHDS is zoonotic or even transmissible to other animals? Are there other animals that get this syndrome? Yeah, so HDS doesn't seem to be zoonotic to us. Um, there are like hemorrhagic diarrhea syndromes that have been described in other animals, but it's not been proven that that's caused by the same, you know, bacteria doing the same toxin production. So I think HDS in itself is probably not zoonotic. Um, however, a lot of differentials like Campylobacter or Salmonella can be zoonotic. Um, so I think it's fair to say that you should probably practice good hand hygiene in a patient with really gross diarrhea. So yeah, I think that's always a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Is it another day of back-to-back -back appointments? Have the drug information and tools you need always within reach. Plums offers continually updated drug information, easy to share guides for pet owners, and new tools like the Drug Interaction Checker, 
designed to help you spot risky drug combinations before they affect your patients. Streamlining your busy day begins at plums.com. So let's talk a bit about treatment now. Early aggressive fluid resuscitation is really critical in order to combat hypovolemia and shock in these patients. Which types of fluids should a clinician reach for first? There's so many options out there. Yeah, I think honestly, in the end, it doesn't matter that much. I think a balanced isotonic crystalloid is the way to go. You just want to replace that volume. So something like LRS, plasma light would probably be the most ideal situation. But if all you have in your in your clinic is um, you know, normal saline or something like that, then that would be totally fair too, as long as it's a isotonic crystalloid. Um, are there there situations where a clinician would reach for a colloid? Yeah, I definitely think that there are. Um, generally speaking, so colloids can definitely be considered in patients that do become severely hypoproteinemic, um, especially if you're having trouble maintaining their blood pressure or they remain really tachycardic after fluid resuscitation. So generally speaking, I'll start with the balanced isotonic crystalloids and then potentially afterwards consider doing like fresh frozen plasma or an albumin transfusion or something like that. Um, obviously, if you don't have plasma or albumin available, you could consider using synthetic colloids too, but um, they do have some potential side effects. It might not be the most ideal choice if you have other options. Okay. And then once you get these patients and get them diagnosed, start rehydrating them, how long do you expect for the PCV to normalize? Yeah. So I I guess I would hope to see some improvement at least within an hour or two hours or something. And so sometimes in the really severe cases, I will recheck a PCV total protein you know, a couple of hours into fluid resuscitation, but I feel for it to normalize, it can often take 12 hours or in some cases, even 24 hours before they completely normalize, um, kind of depending on what their ongoing losses are, how, you know, how aggressive your fluid therapy is and, and how well you're keeping up with those losses. Sure. So oftentimes it sounds like you would expect these patients to be in the hospital for, you know, a, at least a few days. Yeah, I think realistically, most of them do end up staying at least 48 hours. And then there's a lot of other supportive care that we can offer these patients. Um, one thing is is antacids. Antacids are often utilized. Um, is there really evidence to, to support the use of, of these antacid products? I guess it's kind of funny to me that they've found there were no... Um, lesions in the stomach in that study that you had cited earlier and and then but a lot of these medications are targeted at at the stomach and the mucosal barrier so yeah agreed i think oftentimes we give those medications to make ourselves feel better like we're doing something um we don't actually have any evidence to say that they make a difference like specifically in hds in ahds case cases um so i think I usually use it on a case by case basis and antacids. Yes, sure. They're not going to make much difference if difference in your stomach, but it might make your duodenum feel a little bit better if there's not a bunch of super acidic stuff going into your duodenum. So I think, I think in some cases they can be useful, but I don't think they should be standardly used, I guess. Um, okay. Like other supportive care things definitely make sense to me too. Like a lot of these patients do end up being nauseous. So like meropitan or uh, some on Dancitron or something like that could, be very helpful. Um, and then occasionally they can develop pretty significant ilia. So if you want to do like metoclopramide for those cases, that would be fair. Um, although before using metoclopramide, I'd probably take an x-ray of their abdomen just to make sure they're not obstructed. Um, but other than that, like there's no evidence that one of them is better than the other. And I think we, we use a lot of them to make ourselves feel better and act like we're doing something. Yeah. yeah. Well, definitely. We don't want our patients feeling nauseated, you know, oh, sure. and so so those antiemetics, I think, are, are really important. What about pain? I mean, is this considered a painful condition? We know, you know, um, there are several other GI conditions like pancreatitis that we think are very painful. So is there any role for for visceral pain medications in these treatment protocols? Yeah, I agree. They can be very, very painful in some patients and others don't seem to be quite as painful. So I think I think I use it on a case by case basis. Um, so I would see what their abdominal palpation feels like, what their heart rate is doing. You know, obviously their heart rate can be high initially because of shock. But once you feel like you fluid resuscitated them and their heart rate's still high, then maybe it could be because of pain. Um, so I think it's very reasonable to 
try some pain medications in a lot of these patients and something like buprenorphine might be a good option because it doesn't have as many GI side effects like a full mu agonist does. Um, you mm -hmm. obviously would want to avoid using NSAIDs because we don't want even more mucosal damage or something like that. Um, actually, though, the dog with a hematocrit of 80% that I just told you about um, ended up being on an FLK CRI, so on fentanyl, mm. lidocaine, and ketamine because he was so painful. Oh. Um, but he was only that painful for like 12 hours, and then we were able to start weaning him, and then he started eating on his own 36 af hours after presentation. So they do improve pretty rapidly. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly they turn around and from looking so, so horrible dumpy to, to eating. And, and yeah, it can be really rewarding when that happens. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so um, so let's talk a little bit about bacteremia and, you know, some of these more severe cases. You know, there, there can be severe damage to the mucosal barrier. And, you know, we it seems like bacteremia secondary to bacterial translocation should be a huge concern in these patients. But is septicemia really that common a sequela? And, you know, I guess and we'll talk a little bit about antibiotics too. Yeah, so um, there is one study that actually looked at the prevalence of septicemia in AHDS, um, and they found no difference with healthy controls. So honestly, it's probably pretty low. However, they didn't look at like a giant amount of patients. Um, so I mean, I think there is a, a, a risk for septicemia, but I think it's probably lower than what we think or suspect. And, and what type of clinical signs or laboratory values should, should make septicemia pop a little higher, you know, and for a clinician to, to take a little bit more action or look into it more? Yeah, so I think if your systemic signs of like severe illness persist after rehydration and pain management and symptomatic treatment, um, then you should be really concerned that maybe they're septic. Um, so like if they remain really dull or they remain tachycardic or remain hypotensive after you've already, you know, fluid resuscitated them and, and done all the things for them, um, then that should make you a little a little concerned. Or if they have a fever, um, whether that's in the hospital or even on presentation, like that could also make you a little bit more concerned that maybe um, they are septic. And then on blood work, so if you see a really severe neutropenia or a like really severe neutrophilia, so greater than like 25, 30,000, then I think you could also be concerned that maybe there's, again, a little bit more going on. Or potentially if you see a really large amount of band neutrophils, so I know we said earlier, like maybe one, two percent could be normal, but if you're seeing like five, six, seven, ten percent, mm -hmm. like that's probably not normal and, and you should be concerned that they could be septic. Sure, absolutely. And just remembering to try to differentiate that from that stress leukogram, which is going to be common. Yeah. So. Do you have specific criteria? Like, do you have specific criteria that say, okay, I'm going to use antibiotics in this patient? Yeah, I mean, so I think the easy answer to that is if you suspect that they're septic, um, but how do you suspect that they're septic? It, it, it can be really hard to tell sometimes, right? Because they are just very ill mm -hmm. to begin with either way. Um, so I think if they're showing any of the things that we just discussed, then yes, I put them on antibiotics. Um, or if you think they're at high risk for sepsis, um, then that's also a, a, a reasonable thing to do. So if they're immunocompromised or if sure. like you're concerned that they might not be clearing bacteria ineffective, effectively in their in their liver, like if they also have concurrent liver dysfunction or a shunt or something like that. So those patients obviously also probably warrant some antibiotics. Um, I think clinically for me, if they are having, they continue to have really severe blowout diarrhea and they just continue to look really dumpy and, and poor, even though I fluid resuscitated them for a couple of hours, then I think maybe, maybe, maybe I'm a little concerned and maybe they deserve some antibiotics, but. And then what is your first line choice of antibiotics once you've decided that you're going to go ahead and, and pull the trigger and use them? Yep. So um, that's a good question because I feel like there's always a lot of, I guess, choice out there. But since we're giving the antibiotics for concerns for translocation of bacteria, we want to make sure that you use a nice broad spectrum antibiotic, right? So this isn't, we're not actually treating that clostridium. We're trying to treat any other bacteria that are in your gut from like we're trying to kill them from and prevent them from going into your bloodstream leading to sepsis. So you want a broad spectrum antibiotic. So something like ampicillin sulbactam is usually um, the first thing that we tend to go for. I know a lot of people really like to give metronidazole for these cases because they think that they're treating the clostridium. But again, metronidazole is not broad spectrum at all. And um, 
probably don't need to treat that clostridium, um, and it's probably not going to help for translocation things. So I think, um, again, ampicillin, sulbactam, or like a cefazolin or something nice and broad spectrum is a better choice for these guys. And then what about feeding? You know, you had mentioned that your really sick, your really sick patient was, was eating in 36 hours. So, so what role especially does enteral feeding um, play with these patients as well as supplementing things like probiotics? Yep. So enteral feeding is important in any critical patient, but especially in patients with GI disease. So your GI tract really needs nutrition to recover. So you know that if you don't eat your GI tract, your all of your cells will actually like atrophy. And so, you know, we know that your gut needs nutrition to be able to function again properly. And so my kind of rule of thumb is if a patient isn't eating on their own by 24, 36 hours, then I like to place a nasogastric or nas nasoesophageal tube and start feeding small amounts. It doesn't have to be like anything crazy, but just to get some nutrition to those cells. Um, as for probiotics, there is a prospect of study that looked at AHDS dogs and gave them a probiotic or a placebo. And they showed that the dogs with a probiotic treatment um, did have an, have an accelerated normalization of their intestinal microbiome. Um, they didn't necessarily get better any faster. Um, and they did also show that there was a decrease of those net F toxin genes faster than in the dogs that received the, um, the placebo. Um, so also we know that in dogs with acute di diarrhea, so not AHDS, probiotics may shorten the time to normalization of stool. So all in all, we don't have evidence that it makes a giant difference, but it's definitely not going to hurt and it might be beneficial. So I do use it, use it on most of my AHDS cases. And are there specific foods that you're reaching for, like in regards to fat or calorie content, you know, again, comparing to something like pancreatitis where we want a really low fat diet or, or are we just getting anything into them? Yeah, I think I think a, a GI food in general would be probably the most beneficial. Um, I think if they're willing to eat on their own, I'm I'm generally fine with you know pretty much anything like as long as it's not something crazy. But if they want to eat just like GI canned food or even some boiled chicken or something like that, that's totally reasonable. Um, I think when we use the liquid diets down a tube, then usually I'll also go for the the GI one. It doesn't necessarily have to be low fat for these. It's not like the fat is as important as in a, a pancreatitis patient. And what would you say is the overall prognosis for these patients? Yeah. Um, so although dogs that aren't treated could decline really rapidly and can actually die, Generally, dogs that are treated in the, in the hospital with IV fluids and then have uncomplicated AHDS usually consistently show a pretty rapid improvement over the first 24, 48 hours. And so I think they have a, a good prognosis all in all. Um, you know, occasionally you get one of those that just ends up needing plasma and albumin. And if you don't have that available or the owners don't have funds for that, then, you know, maybe that might not end so well. But generally speaking, I think most of them end up having a really good prognosis as long as they get supportive care. Is there a, a high incidence of like recurrence after they go home? How, how should we be monitoring these patients once they've recovered and we've been discharged from the hospital? Yep. So there's not necessarily evidence that like they are more likely to have it again. Um, there is some evidence that could suggest that some of these dogs are more likely to develop chronic diarrhea later in life. Um, so Potentially, it would make sense monitoring for that. And then also, just to go back to the probiotic question from earlier, who knows, maybe those probiotics could decrease the risk of diarrhea later in life, but we don't actually have any studies to back that up. But um, that could be something that we could look at in the future and I think would be very interesting. Yeah, that does sound really interesting. Or, you know, same thing with, you know, maybe modifying the diet moving forward after a, you know, a, an episode of, of this. So all good questions to ask for the future. Yep. Lots of things to learn still. <laughs> yep. That's the best thing about medicine is that there's always new things to learn. For so, sure. Well, that was all of our questions today, but we do have one more little segment at the end of our episodes. We like to play a little game. Uh, it's just a series of quick, would you rather questions? It's just for fun. There's no right or wrong answer. Would you like to play? Sure. All right. Excellent. So first question, if you had to pick up a relief ER shift, would you rather pick it up on a major holiday or during a full moon? Uh, full moon. Full moon. 
Okay. So not superstitious. Nope. <laughs> or I like it busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so you are superstitious. <laughs> So would you rather practice without prednisone or without meropitin? Mm, prednisone. Prednisone. Uh, would you rather cut a GDV in a 150-pound Great Dane or would you rather manage a Chihuahua with DKA? Oh, give me the DKA. Any day? <laughs> you yeah. don't want to cut that Dane? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather your canine or your feline patients could speak? Probably feline. I think canines feline? are easy to read, but felines can, can make it a lot more challenging sometimes. I, yeah, I'm not sure I'd like what they what they would say to me. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'd understand them better. They're just misunderstood. <laughs> All right, final question. If you had to do CPR on a centaur, would you start the chest compressions over the man's chest or over the horse's thorax? I guess I would hope that I had plenty of techs available and maybe we could do both at the same time. Tag team. <laughs> Very good answer. You can't, can't practice without great techs. So. Exactly. <laughs> All right. That was it. You did great. Hopefully our audience learned a lot about acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. Um, <laughs> my last time for saying it today. <laughs> this was really fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed our episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version now available on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review us. You can also listen to or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts, or drop us a line at podcasts at briefmedia.com. Clinicians Brief the Podcast is a brief media production produced by Alexis Ussery and hosted by Dr. Alyssa Watson.